You know how in Mega Man there's those two types of capsules that drop? The ones that regenerate your health and the others that refill your weapon energy? Now, you could write separate code to handle each type of capsule on its own and call it a day, but a better approach would be to abstract it and write a single subroutine that handles the whole mess. In this episode, I'm going to do just that, show you how to write and use subroutines on the NES. Then I'll challenge you to write a subroutine of your own. Most programs aren't just long runs of commands that are executed one after another. As I covered in previous episodes, sometimes programs will make decisions, loop back on themselves, and even jump from point to point. Each one of these is an example of something called control flow, basically how the program controls the flow and execution of instructions. Subroutines are a control flow method, but they're a little different than the ones that I covered before. Where loops and branches usually operate over some connected run of instructions, subroutines allow you to jump from one segment of the code to another and then back again. This allows you to organize your code into sections based on function. For instance, you might have one subroutine that heals the player when they pick up a health container and another routine that deals damage when they get hit by an attack. Writing a subroutine in 6502 assembly is really easy. All you need is a label that denotes the start of the routine, a body of code that performs some action, and then an RTS or return from subroutine instruction at the end. Calling a routine is even easier. Just use a JSR or jump to subroutine instruction, along with a label for the subroutine that you want to call. When the processor encounters the JSR, the program jumps to the start of the routine, then executes the body, and when it reaches the RTS, it jumps right back. The best part is that you can call subroutines as many times as you like from any part of the code. This is particularly useful if you have some common tasks that you need to perform all the time, like 16-bit multiplication. Just write a single routine to handle it and make a JSR call every time it needs to be done. Conceptually, subroutines are simple, powerful, and easy to use, but to get the most out of them, you kind of need to see how they work under the hood. And in order to explain that, I first have to talk about another concept on the 6502, the stack. The stack is a data structure, and it exists in system RAM from address 100 up through 1FF. The structure works just like a stack of books or plates. Every time you want to add something, you put it on top, and every time you want to take something away, you take it from the top. It's first in, last out. The 6502 keeps track of the memory location for the top of the stack using an internal register called the stack pointer, which is bite-sized, so it holds a value from 0 to 255. The value for the stack pointer can be changed directly, and bytes can be pushed and pulled off the stack using a small handful of instructions. Now, the way that the 6502 uses the stack's memory is kind of upside down. You'd think it would start at 100 and grow up, but instead it starts at 1FF and grows down. And while you can manipulate it directly, it's primarily used for reentrant coding, aka interrupts and subroutines. To see how it works, let's take a look at exactly what the processor does when calling a routine. Starting with the JSR, the first order of business is to save an address so that the processor knows where to go back when the routine exits. The 6502 in particular uses the address for the last byte of the jump instruction itself. Remember, every instruction is represented as a series of bytes in a game's ROM, and each byte has a 16-bit address. So what the processor does here is split that 16-bit address into two 8-bit parts, a low byte and a high byte, which it then pushes to the stack. This effectively records the return address, so the processor is free to jump into the subroutine, which it does by directly setting the value for the program counter. The instructions for the routine are then executed as normal until eventually the processor reaches an RTS. To handle the return, the bytes for the address are pulled off of the stack, reconstituted into a single 16-bit value, and then incremented by 1. The result is the address to the first byte of the next instruction directly following the original JSR. To jump back, all the processor needs to do is set the program counter to the computed address. After that, execution simply continues just as it did before. It's as if the program never left. So you might be thinking that this is a pretty convoluted approach to storing a couple of bytes and then using them later. Why not just use a 16-bit register on the processor itself to store the return address? That would work, but only if the subroutine didn't call yet another subroutine. Then you'd need two registers. If the second one called a third, then you'd need three, and you probably see where this is heading. The whole point of using a stack is that it can grow as needed, allowing the programmer a lot more freedom when it comes to writing and calling subroutines. Every time a JSR is called, an address is pushed onto the stack, and every time an RTS is called, an address is pulled off the stack. So the structure not only holds a list of addresses, but also the order in which the addresses need to be returned. Just don't go nesting too many routines, otherwise the pointer will wrap around and cause a stack overflow. 
which is usually not what you're looking for. Okay, that's the basics of how to write and call subroutines on the 60 Papa 2. But before I call it a video, there's one more thing that I want to cover. So let's go take a look back at that Mega Man example. I don't know how the original code worked, but I have an idea of how I would write the subroutine to handle those healing capsules today. I'd equip it with a couple of values called parameters. The first parameter would tell the routine whether or not to fill the health bar or the weapon energy, and the second would tell it by how much to refill. Upon execution, the routine would use these parameters to perform the specific refill, and at that point, I've got one piece of code that handles all of the different capsules. This is a hugely powerful aspect of programming with subroutines. By using parameters, you can generalize a single action and use it to perform a bunch of different operations that are just variations on a theme. That said, how do you actually use parameters in 6502 assembly? Generally speaking, parameters are stored somewhere in the RAM. The idea is that you have the subroutine assign each parameter a specific address, and then you set the data by storing values to those addresses before calling the routine. Parameters can be as large as you want, and you can use any RAM address to store them. But I usually tend to set aside the first 32 bytes of the zero page for use by routines for parameters and return values. Speaking of return values, if you've programmed in higher level languages like C or JavaScript, you know that functions can sometimes return values that are used in other parts of a program. This is pretty easy to do as well. Just have the routine assign a specific address for the return value and make sure to write data there before the RTS. Since there's no specific assembly syntax that dictates what kind of values a routine expects or returns, it's kind of up to you to enforce some sort of standards in your code. There's no right or wrong way to do this. I have my way and other people have theirs. Ultimately, you'll have to do the research, read other people's code, and over time, develop a style that makes sense to you. Okay, challenge time. Instead of having me show you a giant routine and stepping you through instruction by instruction, I want you to go write a routine yourself, specifically that Mega Man style refill routine. Assume that the health and the weapon bars both have values ranging from zero to 100, and that there are four types of capsules, small health, large health, small weapon, and large weapon. Everything else is up to you, like how much energy each type of capsule restores, the specific parameters, and where you hold all the values in RAM. Post your code in the comments, and before the next episode, I'll round up the ones that I like the best. Then me and the supporters over on Patreon are gonna take a vote and pick a winner. The winning post will get pinned to the top of the comment section for this video, forever displaying the author's 6502 assembly prowess for the world to see. If you want to support the channel and get in on stuff like this, consider joining the team and pledging your support at patreon.com forward slash nesshacker. Signing up gets you early access to episodes, behind the scenes updates, and you can even help me choose upcoming topics. Thanks for watching Nesshacker. If you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Click the bell icon if you want to be notified when I post the next video on the channel. And if you have any questions or feedback, let me know in the comments.